the drums just sort of sounded like this. And then I have this sound, which is actually the exact same. This hasn't changed one bit. It's the exact same. Um, and this. There's so many versions of this bloody song. <laughs> there are so many people, especially women, who actually get told that they can't produce. For anyone who feels like they want to do something, you really just have to jump in and give it a go. I hope that anyone seeing this, especially other young women, I hope people see that they can do whatever they want. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional custodians of the land um, on which I'm speaking with you today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today and those who may be listening to this interview in the future as well. Um, my name's Tess Guthrie, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm joined today by the amazing Nina Girati. Thanks so much for um, coming and speaking with me today, Nina. Hey, no, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm so excited. Me um, too. I'm, <laughs> oh my God, so good. Um, I'm very keen to get into this track of yours, um, but I just wanted to start out just for anyone who may not have followed your music in the past. Could you tell me a little bit about um, how you got into production in the first place? Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, I mean, I've been producing as a hobby for a really long time kind of since primary school I wouldn't even call it really producing though I was just sort of uh garage band was like this cool new toy that I had on my mum's new Mac computer when she first got one and I would just sort of play with that for a, a while uh when I got to high school I sort of wanted to do it more and more and garage band just sort of became a little bit limited so I got more softwares and different things and I would just spend time I guess after school or even at school watching YouTube videos and learning how to make beats and then I started DJing my friends parties later in high school and uh, I think it was like 2016 I started putting music on Triple J on Earth and SoundCloud and stuff like that and started showing it to more people and a few people liked it and shared it around and uh, it just sort of grew a little bit uh, over the years until I finished school and then I just started playing a lot of shows and um, yeah I guess I guess people kind of liked some of the songs so I got to keep doing it. <laughs> That's awesome so exciting and when you were um, producing particularly when you're in high school like what kind of instruments were you using or are you mostly just going through the different softwares um, that you were using at the time? Uh, so when I started making music, I was playing the piano. That was the instrument that I learned when I was really young. I played the clarinet for about a year as well, but I wouldn't, if I picked one up now, I probably, I mean, maybe I could remember a few things, but piano was my, my instrument that I still play now a, a little bit just for leisure and stuff. But when I was producing throughout school, it was very much in the box. So it was just mm -hmm. kind of me and laptop. I'd sometimes play piano in to record stuff from there, but I was mostly programming just with like a mouse and stuff like that. Because I, I mm -hmm. guess I was, a lot of the time I was learning and watching videos and things, I'd just be on the bus home from school. So it, it, I just have like my laptop on my lap and <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And where did you find the content to learn? Like, where were you going to source that for yourself? Mostly just YouTube, to be honest, or mm -hmm. I'd just sort of trial and error. Um, I'd just sort of search... I guess, how to make, I don't know, future base in FL Studio or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. And just like find a tutorial of like how to make X sound or like how to uh, do this kind of technique. And eventually th that kind of those, all of those little things just built up. And mm -hmm. uh, it took me a really long time to kind of figure out the interface though. I think that was the hardest thing. And that was a lot of trial and error. But once I sort of knew my way around the software, uh, I, I just gradually sort of learned how to do certain things, but mostly YouTube, I would say. Yeah, right. And what do you think the hardest part was about um, those different softwares or interfaces when you were first learning them? I think just because I didn't really know anything or any structure, I guess it was sort of, uh, it, it was very much like learning 
a language, but mm. I just didn't really know any grammar or things like that. So a lot of the time I would know how to do a certain thing, like in the same way that you might know a bunch of words in another language, but stringing them into a sentence or knowing where they go and stuff like that was really hard um, and making it all kind of make sense and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I just, just nothing, it was all very new to me. So I would just sort of click around until I figured, oh, when I do that, it sounds like this and stuff like that. And that was, <laughs> that was it. I think that's why it probably took me so long to get decent at it as well. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, you're much, much more than decent at it. Um, I think even in the um, in the few minutes that we spent before preparing the tracks over Zoom and things like that, even watching you troubleshoot was an absolute treat. And I feel like I learned a lot just from that. So I'm looking forward to diving into the track itself. But I'm really curious oh, thank to you. know um, about... I think that um, that articulation that you just gave around um, the difference between maybe like grammar versus spelling and how you were originally um, teaching yourself how to use different interfaces. How do you bring that, um, bring your own experience in that to your training that you do now? Because I know that you're um, also a, a trainer in terms of production. Yeah, so I'm a casual trainer at Ableton Live School in Sydney and I'm really lucky that there I guess the course and the classes there have been developed over a really long time by a lot of people who are way better than me <laughs> at production so I sort of just I guess uh, get to lean on the structures that they already have in place there uh, but I guess teaching has definitely made me a better producer in that mm -hmm. I guess I've had to learn how to explain things to people that don't know things that I already know, which sounds very basic, but it was actually really hard for me. Like teaching music theory to someone when I've sort of learned that since I was six years old was really hard because I guess it's, it's like so, sort of trying to teach someone English when you speak English because you just yeah. think, oh, you just, you just know it. You know what I mean? Like it's, totally. it's very yeah. hard to, to think of it as someone who doesn't, I don't know, if that makes sense? Yeah, uh, so no, absolutely, yeah. It just made me a far better producer because I had to think about things in a way that, I, I sort of had to put myself in a position where, what, how would I think about this if I didn't know anything about it? And mm. um, I guess, and people also ask really interesting questions about mm. things that I don't know. And sometimes students will be like, hey, what's that button do? And I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> let me find out. So I get to <laughs> just like <laughs> pick up little bits of knowledge and stuff like that if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it totally does. I feel like that would be a great skill to bring into collaboration as well. Like being able to speak with people about how things work and try and bring their ideas to life from that perspective. Yeah, it's been the best thing for my people skills and my confidence for sure. And I started uh, teaching classes there in my first year out of high school. So it was, a, it was like a big change from sort of being a student my whole life to teaching people this thing and it, it I had to just I guess learn how to give direction and speak properly and, and do all of these things and it's it's definitely made me feel more confident just kind of going into studio sessions with people because I guess I feel more comfortable directing people or figuring out what people are good at and that kind of thing for sure so yeah it's mm -hmm. been very invaluable to me. That's awesome. I'm really curious to know about the role that um, mentorship has played for you um, as you've developed your skills in production and also just throughout your career in general. Do you have any people who um, in particular have been really influential mentors for you? Yeah, absolutely. I would say uh, Nina Las Vegas, um, but definitely on the music business side of things. So, I mean, I have a lot of friends who taught me, who've taught me a bunch of stuff about music and production over time, but on the kind of music business and releasing music side of thing, and I guess in being an artist, definitely in Las Vegas. Uh, I've met her at such a cool time where I'd like just sort of been putting out a bit of music, but I was just finishing school and just sort of figuring out if I wanted to do this kind of full time and I just didn't know anything about anything and she just really has been so generous to me and given me a lot of guidance and signed me to her label and uh, she's just very much been there for me as like a mentor and a friend and like an older sister as well so she's awesome. 
That's and I'm just the biggest fan of her as well, which was like, yeah. it was so cool to start working with her as a fan. Like that was totally. crazy. <laughs> oh my God. I love that so much. Just like when you admire someone's work so much and then you get the chance to actually work with them. Just oh, the best feeling. The best. <laughs> Amazing. And I think you were speaking before as well about um, your relationship with Coda Banks, who is an absolute legend. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about the way that you've been working together and this awesome release that you've just put out together as well. Yeah, for sure. We just released, uh, me and Coda, we released an EP called True North. It's seven tracks, so it's almost a mini album, but we started working on it in early 2019 and it came out about a month ago. So it was sitting there for a while, but yeah, Koda is another person who's definitely feels like a music big sister to me. And I've learned so much from her, uh, I guess, even just about like life and songwriting and putting feelings into music and collaborating uh, so much. I've just learned a lot, a lot from her, but yeah, we, we met in 2018, started working together in 2019 and we really just clicked and hit it off mm. so quickly. And we just happened to become best friends over the time that we we're working together. So when we, the reason we made so many songs is because when we're making music, we don't feel like we're going to work. We just feel like we're going to hang out and it's, we have yeah. this shared hobby that's really productive. So we just end up doing that. <laughs> that's so good. That's the best. Yeah. Um, I'm so lucky to have met her and stuff. She's the best. Yeah, and, and in terms of songwriting, it sounds like she's been really influential for you in that department. I'm really curious as to how your songwriting practice intersects with your production practice, just generally speaking. Yeah, totally. I mean, I started writing songs, like pop songs and stuff, when I was really young, like around the same time or even earlier than I was kind of playing with garage band and stuff like that. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, they weren't good. Like they were, they were fine, but you know, I was like eight or something. So they weren't it's super crazy, but I would just like all my favorite music was pop music and I would get CDs and just sort of look at the lyric booklets and I would see oh, the like, right. verse, chorus, bridge. And I'd be like, oh, cool. So I guess that's how you do it. And then mm. I would just copy and make my own versions of those and stuff. Um, but then after I started making uh beats and producing I got really into dance music so I just sort of forgot about that whole world and stuff for a really long time and the other thing is I'm also not a strong singer like I, I guess I've started singing for the sake of being able to sing my own songs but I'm not really a singer I'm, I'm not a singer in the sense that code is a singer if that makes sense oh, um, but yeah so I, I guess working with her I sort of remembered how like working so closely with an with her who's like an amazing songwriter I guess I got to remember how much I liked doing that kind of stuff uh, and I was just really shy about it for a long time because I didn't think that I I just sort of thought that you, you you're either a singer or you're not kind of thing oh, right. um, yeah. and then working with her made me realize that oh it's just like playing any other instrument you just sort of got to practice it and mm -hmm. yeah I just got to remember how much I liked doing that kind of stuff and she definitely pushed me and told me that I could and supported mm. me a lot in doing that that's great I find it really interesting how um like the identity that we might have as musicians in terms of like what we um feel that we are or that we're not kind of influences what we end up doing sometimes I think yeah because it um I think that your, your voice on these tracks just sounds awesome and works with the the production so so well and so I think a lot of people would probably be surprised to hear that you don't um, feel like or that you you felt kind of shy about your your voice and so I wonder if that also intersects with production in a certain way because I know that for a lot of people um, they don't feel like they can kind of claim the you know the title of being a producer and that that probably influences the way that um, you know all the the kind of permission they give themselves to um, to act in producery ways but do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's such a good point because there was no point, I guess, growing up or any, like at any point really where someone said to me, you can't sing or you shouldn't sing or you shouldn't mm. write songs. It was all just me being silly and making these assumptions about the way that I am. Well, I don't know something like I was my own, I was holding myself back. I was my own biggest enemy really. And I'm sure there are so many people, especially women who actually get told that they can't produce who yeah. probably have these same mental blocks uh 
and that would definitely influence the way that they make music because if I hadn't have been holding myself back or putting limits on myself I could have been releasing music with my vocals on it like three years ago um, wow. but I didn't because I didn't I didn't think that I should do that um, which was so silly but I don't know that's just been my journey but I think definitely for anyone who's watching this who feels like they want to do something even like a tiny bit even if they just want to do it a little bit but they feel like they shouldn't do it just give it a go because there's really no one else who can I guess do that for you like you really just have to jump in and give it a go I was lucky I had Coda and I guess other people just to encourage me and it gave me a confidence over time to sort of try singing and stuff like that but yeah I feel like you definitely shouldn't put those kind of blocks on yourself like I did for a long time. <laughs> yeah, but I, I also think like it, it's absolutely like no one's fault if they're experiencing like those blockages. And, and so I think that's, yeah, it's really amazing that you kind of set this example um, for so many um, women and um, and just, you know, being able to show your production skills to so that they can see an example of that happening and then be able to, um, you know, redefine hopefully for themselves um, what they what they can do as well so I find it really inspiring anyway oh yeah for sure I mean thank you so much and also like I hope that anyone seeing this especially um, especially other young women like maybe me watching YouTube tutorials 10 years ago like I, I hope this makes some people see that they can do whatever they want as well like that anyone really can I think for sure yeah Oh, amazing. I feel like that would be, that's a great time to be jumping into this track, um, which I'm very excited to hear more about in terms of like the nitty gritties of how it happened. Um, so could you tell me first of all about like what the song is about in, from like a songwriting perspective and where the idea for, for it started? Yeah, totally. So um, this song is called Bloomy Air and it's named after a character from one of my favourite video games of all time. Um, and it's, I guess, from a songwriting perspective, it's not about anything in particular because there is a little bit of a vocal verse on it, but it's not, I guess, it's it's more just sort of, it was a rough voice memo idea that fit really nicely over this track. I guess the lyrics are a little bit abstract, but it's kind of more of like a club track. Um, cool. It's, it's yeah, it's not, I, I mean, there's definitely a bit of like a pop structure to it in a way, but it's still very like kind of four to the floor kick mm. drums and um it's I, I made it with the hopes that i would get to play it at a bunch of shows this year but maybe next year alas. <laughs> but alas yeah exactly yeah. but yeah it's kind of one that i started in early 2018 and it was just this really rough idea but i really liked it i liked the melodies and stuff and i would just come back to it every now and then it was one of those demos that i just come back and go oh maybe i can make this one work today and then i'd mm. put it away and then six months later be like oh maybe this one but eventually it just clicked one day and I figured it out and now it's I'm really happy that it worked out so yeah that was how this one came together yeah and was there anything in particular that just kind of made it click like was there any anything that influenced that yeah I think there was this one uh, I think it was maybe even just showing it to um, my friends and my team and stuff because mm. For a while, I had a few different structure changes with it, and then I finally got it to one version that I thought was really rough. But I was like, "Oh, like I guess it's alright." Mm -hmm. And then I showed it to uh, I showed it to Nina, I think, like Nina Las Vegas, and she was like, "Oh, this is cool. You should just like try put that there and make that longer." And I was like, "Oh, actually, you're right. Like it's it's kind of already halfway there." And then I just kind of kept ticking away and uh, kept adding more layers, and eventually it just it was. It was a, a long road with this one, but it got there and I'm really happy with it now. Awesome. And which part would you like to show us first? Um, so I've got a couple of different versions of it in here. Uh, I can show you the very first version. There's not even an arrangement. That. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's not even an arrangement in wow. here. It's just a bunch of loops and sounds and stuff that uh, I thought were cool. And then eventually yeah. I laid it out into arrangements. So I can show you that. Uh, then I can show you a more developed version and then I've got the mix session as well for um because I mixed this and most of the other tracks on this EP so they're all in here as well yeah yeah awesome very very keen so here we actually have the mix session 
this might be moving backwards a little bit, but so this is actually how it sounded when it was finished. Mm -hmm. um, I really hope this plays, uh, but there's a whole bunch of, there's, yeah, there's about, oh, there's some reference tracks in there, uh, but there's about a hundred tracks in wow. there roughly. Um, some of them aren't active, like all of these kick ones, I ended up just combining into like the kicks group track. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a couple of other things. There's a bunch of snares, uh, drums. I kind of like to have all the drums at the top. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of percussion, uh, effects, a lot of that stuff. There's basses, so there was a whole, a whole bunch of basses in there. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, wow, seven, stacks of bass. eight-ish bass sounds. Wow. And yeah, I mean, they, they weren't all necessarily running at the same time. Um, I'm just really <laughs> curious about your decision making behind um, putting so many bass tracks on it. Um, so that was actually one of the things that kind of got it to where, I mean, it was one of those things where the first, that first version I had of it, it just sort of had one or two little layers in there. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking like, oh, this is all right, but it's just a bit boring or something like that and then oh. I just kept kind of kept adding layers and making it sound bigger because I, I what I thought the problem was that the actual bass pattern was boring but I realized it was just the sound so I just sort of added more in and eventually got it here so I'll see if I can solo I hope these are I hope my CPU is kind of going crazy up here but I'm going to solo this and see if it'll play these oh it's sort of just yeah, yeah I don't know if it's coming Yeah, so some of the layers are just really, really subtle. Wow. I can't believe this session's working. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, success. Um, but yeah, there was a bunch of bass layers. Uh, this arc was one of the first things I started with. Yeah, so that was one of the first sounds I started with. Mm -hmm. uh, these chords I started with as well. Uh, down here. These were these chords were a late addition. Uh, this lead, this was one of the things I kept coming back to that I thought because when I first made the the first idea, this was this lead was one of the things where I was like, oh, this is actually pretty cool. I should try and make something out of this. Um, mm. Maybe not there. Maybe it was this part. Um, this choir. This was my voice. Uh, it's just really. Um, it's just a. It's not like really singing or anything. Just some fire noises. Yeah, cool. Um, just some ambience. Uh, the vocals were here. Uh, they're a bit like rough, but <laughs> they're in there. Uh, and then down here, these vocals were actually really fun uh, because this is actually my friend, uh, my best friend from high school, talking into the mic. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, so it was on my birthday last year. She was at my house and I was just showing her how auto-tune works. Uh, yep. so she, <laughs> she was just, her and a couple of other, of my other friends were there and I, they were just sort of having fun. Like I was putting different effects on their voices and they were just singing into my mic and it was kind of like karaoke. And I just was, I was capturing a bunch of it. I don't even know if they realized at the time. I definitely got her permission to put this in here. But at the time I was just capturing a bunch of it because I thought it would be really funny just to sample mm. later. And uh, I mean, I, this is in this mix session, these are all bounce to stems. But if I open another version, I'll be able to show you uh, how it sounds. But yeah, if I solo this. <laughs> Yeah, that's just all her, Whoa. just sort of being being silly in there. This is all percussion, uh, and then down here, this is a this is the pre remix by AB between them. I don't know if you can hear. There's like a tiny little difference. And sorry, this is also probably coming through really quiet because I had uh, I had the, the master nice and low for for the pre master, but. Yeah, that was the mix session. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. And yeah, I'm glad that one worked finally. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds so good. And would you mind talking me through a little bit more of um, the vocal effects that you used? Because I feel like they're so distinctive for your sound. Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Um, there's a bunch of stuff. I mostly use just sort of like stock Ableton stuff. So this is on the whole group, uh, on the actual vocals themselves. 
Mm. There's a bit of third party stuff. So I'll solo this one and you can just sort of hear before and after maybe. Um, mm, that'd be great. Whenever I go, place we only knew. Whenever I go. So that's my my raw vocal in there. And then turn it on. So I've got like some EQing and then I've got a um, tuning device. So this is like my auto tune here. I use Waves Tune. Yep. Uh, and then here we've got an RX7 plugin that was just sort of denoising it a bunch uh and then here got the sand toys little altar boy and i just sort of pitched it up very slightly or not pitched it up but i just moved the formants up a little bit so i just sort of made it sound slightly more chipmunky mm -hmm. um just because i wanted it i didn't want this to be like a singing song i wanted to be a little bit more abstract uh then we've got some compression had it gated um there's a multi-band preset on there uh that was just sort of tightening it up a little bit more more EQ and then more compression just there. And then I had that, I think, on all of these individually. And then on the group, there's a bit more uh, here. I think there's more of an effect. Oh, yeah, so here you can hear uh, the vocal kind of has a moment with this frequency shifter. So that was this one here, moving that one around. Um, yeah, but that's kind of what's going on in there in terms of this these vocals down here i think the effects might actually be baked into the stem but like i said if they are i can oh yeah so they're already baked in but uh i can jump into another session and show you those ones if you'd like as well um, yeah great very cool yeah so that was but that was all the stuff i did on the on my vocals at least in there mm, awesome yeah, thank you so much for going through that in so much detail. Is is there any other bits of that um, the mix session that you'd like to talk us through? Um, good question. I mean, it's actually like fun for me right now looking through this because I haven't been in this session for for so long. Um, looking at this stuff, but if I just flick through um, these, you can kind of see some of the some of the tracks don't have anything on them because I was kind of just cool with how they were sounding already, and then mm -hmm. some of them just have. A few odd effects on them. A lot of what I was doing in this session was even just sort of rebalancing the volumes out. So once I kind of had the song finished, I printed everything to stems and then made this new session and pulled all the volumes of every track all the way down. And then I just sort of brought them all up one by one because I found I find that uh, if if I'm just trying to I guess volume balance something and work with the balance that's already there, I'm already a little bit biased because. There's this balance that's already there and I'm just sort of pushing and pulling things, but it's hard to, I guess, tell uh, what I'm really changing, I guess. So I just sort of had this reference down here, this full mix reference. I also had uh, one of my other tracks in there that was already mixed as a reference so I could try to get it close to that. And then I had this track here, uh, Moolah by Eliminate, which I just think sounds really good and I love how it sounds in headphones and also in the club so mm -hmm. I had that one there as a reference to sort of refer to as well but then I had the old mix just there just so I could sort of come back to the old one and listen to what I've changed and stuff but yeah then I would just bring up the volumes kind of one by one mm -hmm. uh, so that I'm just sort of starting all the way from the start again and I can always come back to the old version there as well if that makes sense um, yeah so I, I just sort of bring up the, the drums first uh, and I always like to have the kick at the top and then then snares and then the less important drums as it goes down so I'd sort of get all of the drums going well together then bring the bass in uh, and balance the basses uh, between themselves as well uh, from there bring in kind of the more melodic group stuff and you can see that this chords group was uh, was originally six different chords tracks and I just sort of compressed it down to one because I got the balance good and uh, they can they kind of sound a little different throughout so here versus here they're a little thinner uh, and yeah but I just sort of uh, in this session same with the kicks uh, you can see there was a, a bunch of kicks six kicks there that I just sort of brought into this one kicks group or two two track thing because at this stage in the the process, it just made sense to kind of have uh, less and less. Same as the toms, I just sort of grouped them into one verse toms. Uh, yeah, a few things, other things, we'll scroll down. Uh, 
the I actually uh, didn't have vocals in this track until about like two weeks before it was done. Um, Whoa. Yeah, so the very early versions of it and the way it sounded for about two years was just all instrumental. And then, yeah, and I, I, I was really like opposed to having vocals in it, not opposed to it, but a few people suggested it and I was like, no, nah, like I don't think it needs that or it's just not what I imagined for it. Uh, but eventually I just sort of, I thought oh, I'll give it a go because a few people suggested it and then it just worked. So I thought, cool. Um, I'll leave them in there. Uh, but yeah, the, the choir, there's all of the individual choir sounds, and then I've got the whole group there. Uh, and then all of these little bits of vocal percussion as well. I think I solo all of these together. They were all just kind of bits and pieces of me uh, making different noises, or I'd cut them out of my vocals and stuff like that. Uh, this one here actually, uh, I think, that one and there's another one somewhere here, maybe this one, not quite, sorry there's one particular, this one here I think. So that's me but it was it was actually a, the end of a voice memo of me talking so I was in oh. a session I don't have the original one anymore at least I mean at least not in here it's definitely on my phone somewhere but mm -hmm. I was in a session uh, with someone and we were recording something and then at the end of it I yawned and said oh we shouldn't do that or something like that and I can't even remember what the context was but I just put it into like an auto tune and put some effects on it and it kind of this is actually a yawn at the start but <laughs> because it's kind of been run through all this stuff it doesn't sound like it anymore uh but but yeah these were that those were all kind of the the main parts i had this little part as well actually this was the one kind of vocally part i had for a while before i actually did actually added in the full verse which sounded uh like this uh whoops sorry i'll solo those And then here as well. Uh, yeah, I can't remember how that came about, but I remember about maybe a year after, so like early 2019, I added that little vocal chop into into it. And then, but I didn't add the rest of the vocals until yeah, like less than a month after the song was like fully finished. Uh, but yeah, th those were all all kind of the unless uh, unless you can see any parts that I've sort of skipped out on I mean I added these these chords sort of late uh, just because I wanted to elevate this part and just sort of set it apart from the first drop section back here mm -hmm. um, but yeah so many so many bits let me know if I've uh, skipped over oh there's some ambience sorry I'm, I'm just digging through and finding new bits that I, <laughs> I've forgotten weird. about because I've I haven't uh, dug through this in depth in a while but mm. uh, there was some rain and thunder samples and I just condensed them down into this ambience group here but mm. I thought that sounded kind of nice uh, in the, yeah. the breakish part of the tracks and then here there's like a little screaming sound as well which is fun uh, and yeah a bunch of kind of effecty there's some noise here um, more kind of fill stuff all throughout here um, wow, just lots so of little bits detail. that sort of add it up together sorry oh, sorry so what did detail. you say I didn't mean to cut oh you off gosh. at all <laughs> no I'm so sorry I think I, I just was so excited because there's so much detail in there like it's just like a treasure chest of different bits and pieces Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that was kind of uh, all the parts, unless you can see anything that I might have skipped over. Um, yeah, but no, that's there amazing. she is. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Can I ask you more of a general question? Yeah, absolutely. I'm really curious about, like, how you view kind of the difference between um, production and mixing. Um, so... For a long time, I was having other people help with mixing my music and I didn't really, especially when I was learning to 
produce. Mm -hmm. I feel like I wasn't really learning to produce. I was more just learning to like make beats and arrange sounds and stuff like that. I really didn't know anything technical and I have, don't feel like I've been a decent technical producer until about a year or two ago, maybe a year and a half ish or something like that. Um, yeah, because I, I would just sort of get sounds and lay them out. And I think I had good ideas and I knew how to write melodies and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but I didn't know much about like sound or physics and frequencies and things like that until a little while ago. Uh, but I guess now I, I'm, and I, for a while I have always sort of like mixed as I go as such. So mm -hmm. as I'm working on the, I'll let the mixing inform my songwriting a little bit in terms of if I'm designing sounds or I'm choosing drums, you know, I'll, I'll choose things based on if I think they're going to sit well with everything else or if I think they're going to cause me problems later when I'm trying to get everything sounding good, uh, if that makes sense. But I always try to separate it out a little bit. So once I feel like the song is done uh, and doesn't need any more stuff or doesn't need anything stripped out of it, uh, then I'll just sort of bounce everything down to audio so I'll, I'll export all the stems and then that just kind of forces me to not be creative and then when I'm opening in a mix session I'm just trying to purely think of what sounds good and I'll be listening to other references and stuff like that but I'm also not that fantastic at mixing yet I don't think it's still pretty new to me and uh, I've just, I've worked on my music, uh, mixes for my music and mine and Coda's EP a little bit. And I've done a little bit of work for some friends and other people, but definitely not a pro. <laughs> um, but it's a skill I've been trying to develop over this year for sure. Yeah, wow. I'm, I'm really loving that um, technique that you mentioned about having reference tracks to listen to just on hand in the actual session and then pulling everything up to match the different volumes that you want to achieve to get that kind of sound um, and not going from the, the kind of baseline of everything just being at zero. I think that's really interesting to take that approach. Yeah, I think it's really helpful having especially references, uh, especially if you're sort of mixing everything else from zero, it's nice to have like the old version there just so you can, sometimes you might just be driving yourself crazy thinking, oh my God, have I even improved this? Like I've been sitting right. here, have yeah. I, I've been sitting here for an hour balancing volumes, have I even gotten anywhere? So it's nice just to be able to tab over to the old version and hear where you come from and it's nice to, I guess, have tracks and be able to know what you like um, and mm. what, what sounds good to you because then you can sort of have it there. And uh, it's happened to me, a, a, you know, a few times, especially with vocals, because I don't really, I don't think I'm that good at mixing vocals yet, at least. Uh, but it's happened to me that I have a song called Tethered to the Body. And in that song for ages, I thought the vocals sounded really bad and I just couldn't, figure out why. So I did a bunch of digging through tracks and figured out how I wanted them to sound. And then I literally just dropped the files in and went AB uh, back and forth until I got them sounding like the reference that I brought in. And then it just solved it. Because for ages I was like, why do these just suck? And <laughs> it was because I didn't know how I wanted them to sound really. So I just had to do a bunch of digging and find that. And and, and yeah, I like, have, I like, really like having some, everything start from zero and bringing them in one by one. Cause yeah, like I said before, if I don't do that, I feel like I just end up fighting with the mixes that's already there rather than kind of starting again. Type thing. Yeah. Gosh, I feel like there's two really, really good lessons in there for me, at least like the first of which being that it, it sounds like it's relatively normal to go through different stages where you feel like everything sounds crap. And then you think that everything's great again. Um, and then it kind of goes in waves. Would you say that that's true? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there's this song on mine and Coda's EP that we put out recently called Middle of the Night. That is the first time I've actually gotten teary over like wow. a mix before. Like, oh my God, it was, I thought it sounded so bad. The, the thing was literally mastered and <laughs> we went back because I, uh, I don't know, me and uh, other Nina, uh, like in Las Vegas and mm. some people just like it just we just thought oh it's just not there uh, so we went back and into the studio for like 48 hours and just redid it 
And by the end of it, I was just going crazy, like just listening to the same song over and over and over. And I feel like such a rat saying that because there are people who do that for their full time job and they do it really well and they don't crack under it but <laughs> me I, I was just like oh I hate this I'm sick of this I can't even tell if this sounds good anymore so everyone else was saying it sounded good so I just like let it go and then three days later I didn't listen to it for three days I came back three days later I was like oh this is fantastic like we, <laughs> we did it we fixed it this song is fine now um but yeah definitely I think it's kind of nice to go through those times when you think everything sounds bad because then once you shake it off you kind of have like this cleansed palette and you're like oh actually everything Mm. sounds pretty good (laughs) yeah for sure I bet that um break kind of helps because I think there's a additional um tricky part when you're an artist as well is that you know you're not just kind of mixing something that you have no emotional attachment to or that you haven't been there for like the whole journey of what the song has become and so I can imagine that there would be this added kind of emotional component of mixing a track that's your own and feeling kind of frustrated with it compared to just mixing you know another track that someone else's and you know you don't really care about it that much because it's your nine to five or you know although I'm sure mix engineers always pour love into their work but I think um, it sounds like having that break um, could really help to add a little bit more air into the process and it sounds like that was really helpful for you in that context. Oh yeah, definitely. Especially because yeah, like you said, I wanted to, well, I do, I do love this song, but I really wanted to love it because it's Mm. my work and it's this song we've been working on for like over a year or this project we've been working on. So yeah, like you said, there was definitely a big emotional part of it where it was like, I really want this to sound good because if it doesn't, it's like, it's on me. (laughs) Like, I don't want to hate this work that I'm putting out by the end of it, if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah, for sure. But I think it was definitely just having that break from listening to it and then coming back and also just having someone else there Mm. to work on it. Like Coda was in the room when I was doing most of the mixing. So, and she doesn't have the same purely because she's not a producer or a mixing person, but she just doesn't have the same ear for that kind of stuff. So it's kind of nice and refreshing having someone there to be like, Oh no, that sounds good. You're overthinking it. Or like, She'll point out things that I don't notice and it's really helpful. It's nice having a tag team in that way. Yeah, totally. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that sort of um, takes me back to the the second thing that I got out of your of what, out of what you were just saying. Um, but it, it sounds like it's kind of easier to make things kind of feel like they sound good to you um, if you know what kind of sound you want to get. So like listening to different tracks and noticing, you know, I want the vocal to sound like this or I want the drums to sound like this um, or I want it to kind of have a little bit of this but a little bit more bass or, you know, etc. Like having that um, that. I suppose, guideline to, to aim for sounds like it makes the workflow a bit easier. Is that right? Yeah, I think definitely in the more mixy stages uh, right. with, with production and songwriting, I think it's good to know what you like, but it can also be kind of nice to just not know what you're going for and just stumble mm. upon things. Um, but definitely when it gets to later stage and you're job is purely just to make the thing sound good um Mm. I think or like that's what you're there on that day to just turn up like okay the song's done I just need to make it sound good now when it gets to that stage I think it's nice to know what you're aiming for because then it's it's you know you just want to get the job done (laughs) at that stage I think yeah um but early on I think it's nice to sort of not know and fumble around and just find things by accident but it's also good to know what you like I think yeah That's really cool. I'd love to hear more about um, what that was like for you in terms of um, what bits and pieces you kind of stumbled upon that became the inspiration for this track. For this particular track? Yeah. Yeah. So this particular track, I actually started when I was first training to work at live school. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was part of one of the activities and I ended up making that little melody and the arpeggio and Mm. I just sort of saved it and put it away in the folder and it would, yeah, just be one of those things that sort of come up and if I scroll through, I'll I'll just try and find things uh, that I can, I mean, that that vocal of my friends that I mentioned, the Mm. little speech vocal, that was definitely uh, a found thing where I was, I just wanted some kind of like glitchy vocal element. So I just went through 
what I already had on my computer. I thought, oh yeah, that, I have that thing. That so I just messaged my friend and said, hey, can I put your voice in my song? And she's like, yeah, man, <laughs> go for it. Um, but I'm trying to think. Aside from that, did I think, was there any found stuff in here? Uh, I mean, maybe the rain and thunder samples. Um, mm. Yeah, it's kind of nice having that stuff on hand uh, as well. Um, this definitely this FM bass here. And a lot of these sounds actually, if I kind of cut a few of them away, uh, you'll be able to hear how the, the thing, the bass sounded, I guess, before I sort of added in all these layers. So I think maybe, yeah, if I take away that one and this one. Even. Yeah, so it kind of sounded more just like this. I know it's super quiet. I can crank this up a little bit. And then when I stumbled across these sounds to add in, it just sort of made it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Kind of bigger. Yeah. Uh, and that was something that I just didn't think to do for ages. Because a long time I thought, oh, the, the bass is boring just because the, the actual pattern is boring. Um, but then I realized I, right. the sound just needed more. So I just... Mm -hmm built those extra layers uh, to add in there as well. Um, yeah, but I would say the, the funnest accident that came with this song was definitely adding my friend's voice in here with these funny talking, this stuff here. This was really fun. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Um, I'm curious about the, um, the initial sessions that you were showing me through before as well in terms of... Um, how like how the track sounded at first and then how it kind of went through a couple of iterations before getting to the final thing but would you be um comfortable showing me through some of the um initial stages of the work yeah so this was yeah the first version of it i don't think there was even an arrangement at this stage it was just a bunch of uh loops and stuff that i'd made in the the work exercise uh, if it opens i hope it does okay cool here we go yeah so this is what it looks like over here there's actually there's like nothing going on it's totally empty but over here there's a bunch of different sounds so the drums just sort of sounded like this and then i had this sound which is actually the exact same this hasn't changed one bit it's the exact same um and this It's the same, that those just haven't changed. I think maybe this one, that ended up not making the cut. Uh, I think this bass, yeah. Uh, it's obviously been modified a bunch since then, but that sound is still in there, and these, with this sound here. Yeah, so all of those sounds that are playing now ended up being in the final track. They were just all kind of modified a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that was how it how it started out in like two and a half years ago. Crazy. Yeah, uh, wow. And yeah, it's it's so it doesn't feel like that long ago. But then a year later, it sounded like this. So here I had a bit of an arrangement. You can see I'd like named some things. Mm. Um, but if I play a bit of it. So I just sort of started to lay things out a little bit more. And then here, the bass comes in. A lot of the structure is kind of similar to how it is now. There's this break. This is in, yeah, again, this structure is the exact same. Uh, it's just that this just sounds so dull here. <laughs> and then eventually it goes back to drums. I have this version of it that I'll try and find that I was, I was, my last shows before I, before COVID and lockdown and stuff like that were supporting What's or Not around Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. It was so fun and I had this really beta 
demo version of this song that was half the length and I was playing it as the opening to my set, like oh, the first cool. song in my set. Yeah, but at the time it just sounded so much emptier and mm. I thought that was all it was going to be. I thought it was going to be an EP intro track uh, mm. that was sort of empty. And uh, But then after I finished it, I was like, cool, can't wait to play this out on more shows. And then there were no more shows. <laughs> That's all right. I'd love to ask you a little bit more about like what steps you took to get it from its original form into its more developed form in terms of like any kind of tricks or tips um, that people could use in their own practice. Yeah, totally. I'll um I'll get it up, open up, and then I'll pull out the parts that were added from, oh, great. from the first version. Awesome. 16, 3, 20. I'm sure this is the one where it was, it was like, there and I thought it was done and I was like okay this is this is it this is just like a little two minute long short intro song that's kind of cool but Mm. not my favorite thing and then um I got pushed to just like try some more stuff this is it this is the one so you can hear this is what the the build-up sounds almost the same but the drop is just like so dead like and (laughs) like and I thought this was done I was playing this as this first song in my set on tour and I thought yeah this is cool it's fine like it's not the best thing I've made but it'll do and I'm so glad I pushed it it's just so empty um I feel like people would still go off to that um, I mean, I hope so because I was gonna release it, but I'm just like, ugh, I like, I'm just so glad I didn't settle, and I yeah, pushed right. it. Yeah, I really did almost just leave it at that and not push it any further, but I'm glad I did. Um, second drop was just the same. So empty. And I think I got to a point where I was just gonna have the one drop and then make it fade out here because I didn't see the point of this second one. I was just like, oh, that's fine. I think I just had it in there for tour because in case um, I needed more time in my set or something like that, Mm. it's nice to have like a backup extra drop there. Uh, But but yeah, this was was it, I think. Um, Mm. There's some stuff in here, Uh, the kick. Um, There's like a kind of like a hard style kick laid on top there. This is all the bass. Yeah, so you can see there's only like three layers in there instead of the seven that ended up. Here's all the chords layers. So two of those are muted at the moment, but. And that one's kind of more of a texture. Uh, and then this one here. These ones, the more fluidy ones. Uh, the arps are still the same. The only difference is I kind of added like a little tiny layer on top, super quiet, but it just sort of made it a little brighter. Uh, And then the leads, uh, the lead, I still have this original one. And then I just added like this little transient on top of it. So it kind of sounded more like a mallet, I guess. Mm. Um, the snares, I swapped out a whole bunch. Uh, that was a lot of that stuff was with this delay here. So you can see that moving around if I play from here. Oh, so you automated the delay across there. Yeah, so that the time was sort of helping that kind of sound a little bit funny. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, some more snare stuff here. There, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many versions of this bloody song. <laughs> there's, there's so many like silly ideas that didn't didn't make the cut. I think kind of the main thing that was getting it from how it sounded in that first version was well, first of all, layering it out. Uh, laying it out sorry and then also just having a bunch of effects in there that weren't there before like just even this mm. this kind of stuff like as kind of simple as it is and cheesy as it sounds on its own it really kind of makes it sound like if i mute that and just play this part here i 
think it's just a lot less epic than if I were to. Wow, yeah. So it's just all these little things that sort of add up and all of these parts here. Uh, like this thing. Um, all of this part, like if I kind of, if I muted all of this. It's just not as exciting as if I were to, sorry, turn all these back on. Yeah, just all of those tiny little bits kind of add up, I think. Uh, yeah, here's my choir vocals as well. Um, not that they're, they're nothing crazy, but... I think on each of these I just had yes and tune and a bunch of reverb, but if I take all that off... <laughs> this is my terribly out of tune voice. Um, and there's just a bunch of those layers. Nice, wow. It sounds like there were so many decisions that were made along the way that just added up to this awesome track. Um, and that, you know, any one of those decisions, you know, wouldn't have made it into what it is today. And yet it sounds like it was all very exploratory as well. And like that some of it was kind of stumbled upon. So yeah, I really love that as a process. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, not all of my songs have been like this a lot of them or not a lot of them but some of them have been a lot more intentional where I've sort of sat down and gone I want to make something that sounds like this and then I just sort of do it that was just that's happened sometimes but I kind of yeah this has been really fun and I'm really proud of this song for that reason because it it did sort of take so long and there were so many forks in the road I guess um yeah it was it was really fun track to work on and rewarding when you get to the end of something that takes that long as well yeah absolutely and is there any other bits that you'd like to um show me through so there was this version of it that i made in like early mid 2019 where i was trying kind of trying to make a drop mm. uh and i thought this was going to be it yeah so this is again same kind of structure yeah this is it That was just another idea that I threw together at one point um, that I didn't end up using any of that, but maybe I will for another song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. That's so cool that like bits and pieces like that can form the bones of another song all together, even if they don't yeah. work anything. Yeah, all the time. I never delete stuff. Maybe that makes me a hoarder, but um, I always end up being in a session like two years later and I'm like, oh, I just need something to, oh yeah, that thing I did three years ago that sucked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I just kind of always have it there in a little bank. And now it's great because it's in a different context. <laughs> totally. You just never know. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. No, I think that's a great approach. And yeah, I think a lot of um, artists have just like hundreds and hundreds of voice memos and things like that. So I think it's a, a pretty common practice to pe for people to um, keep a lot of sounds just in case they happen to be useful in other contexts as well, or they kind of provoke something that can be um, used to create something new. Yeah, 100%. You just don't, you just never know when something is going to, because it's happened the opposite before where I have deleted something and been like, ah, oh, why did I delete that? Or yeah. So I think it's so good to just hold on to stuff like that for sure. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much for going through that in so much detail. I feel like I learned so much from seeing that, like your process in that much granularity. Oh, I'm so glad. No, thanks for letting me talk about my stuff. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, I, I'm really curious as to um, whether there were any turning points for you in terms of feeling confident to identify as a producer and really kind of owning that title. Um, good question. I mean, I think for me, I've always just sort of, I don't, that's not something I've struggled with. I think, mm. I think I've, I still struggle to this day. Uh, when well, I'm not to this day, that makes it sound like I've struggled with this for a long time, but I, I kind of maybe have that issue now with calling myself like 
a singer because sometimes mm. people people will say to me like oh like you're singing on your songs now and I'm like oh no I'm not <laughs> like stop that <laughs> um like I think that's sort of the sore spot for me maybe that I'm sort of just using my voice is something that I'm still a little bit shy with and trying to overcome but mm. being a producer I think I guess as soon as I maybe started um uh, I guess putting songs out there I would have in my bio such and such producer from such and such and I just kind of felt like that's that's what I am that's what I'm doing and maybe that's what helped me own it actually to be honest is having to write a bio on Triple J on Earth because I would just copy other people's and it would just be like 16 year old producer from the Central Coast and I was like oh cool that's me I guess so that was probably now that I think about it that's probably what helped me own it maybe <laughs> yeah that's really good to know um, and do you have any advice for people who might just be starting their production journey or for people who um, maybe have had a bit of experience with different softwares but are still trying to figure out how to um, get the kind of sound that they want to get out of them? Um, I'd probably say patience and having like a long-term goal for learning um, mm. because there's just so much like it's so vast and I still don't think I'm that good of like a producer or a mixed person or anything like that I can think I know what I'm doing now but mm -hmm. um, there's just so much to learn all the time um, and there's always new devices coming out and it can get overwhelming I think and especially if you're trying to learn and there's just so many tutorials and you've got so much saved to your YouTube watch list and it's just frustrating. It's like, oh, why can't I just do it now? It's, I think if you just maybe set a pace for yourself and just set like a goal to maybe just learn one small new thing every day or just make one new loop every day or like make one song a week, even if the song is bad and isn't something that you intend to show anyone just for the practice of making. And yeah, that's the other thing, actually. I'd probably say just make, uh, just keep making for making like don't mm. feel like you have to go in every day and be like today I'm gonna make something that I love and sounds like me and I'm gonna release it and show people because that's just a lot of pressure to put on yourself and you just mm. like you just never know when what you make is going to come in handy later um, so I think if you just make something every day even if it's not something you ever want to release or have for your artist thing it's just kind of good practice and just pace it I think for sure yeah, that's excellent advice. I love how that takes the pressure off in a pretty big way as well. Yeah, like, because I think it can get frustrating sometimes when it's like, oh my God, I've been working with this program for X amount of time and I still can't do this. It's uh, like, I guess if you just have one little new thing every day, it's just a lot more easy to handle maybe. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Nina. This has been really awesome to chat to you and just so beneficial to hear about your process in this much detail. Thank you so much. Oh, no, thank you for having me and you're so welcome. And I'm glad it's uh, been interesting for you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yay. And um, is there anything coming up that you'd like people to check out or do you have any recommendations of um, either places that you've gone to learn about um you know more production techniques in the past um first of all uh well we me and Koda released an ep called true north i'd love if you guys could check that out i also released an ep called Blumia earlier this year that's yep. still i guess relatively new enough <laughs> if you want to check that out as well um aside from that i guess uh i mean i'm a trainer at Ableton Live School. I love it there. I love working there, but also just like YouTube and making friends as well. If you just like make friends, uh, even online, and if you can just skill swap and teach each other one new thing a day and just trade ideas and stuff, that's super valuable as well. I've got a few good friends now who are producers that I met when I was in high school and I never hung out with them that much when I was in high school, but we just would trade production stuff. And now we hang out now and those friends are so valuable to me. So, yeah. Awesome. And speaking of online, um, just in general, where can people find you? Um, online, I'm just at Nina Jirachi everywhere. Awesome. It's a, it's a bit funny to spell, but that's the name. <laughs> it's worth it though, once you spell it. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> 